are in listen-only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr, and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network. Uh, this webinar is organized by the EBM Tools Network as well as OpenChannels.org. And so we're all very glad you could be here today. Um, this webinar is on a report that's recently come out come out about fish carbon meeting the climate change challenge and presenting today we'll have Stephen Lutz of Grid Arendal and Angela Martin of Blue Climate Solutions. Before we get started I wanted to let everyone know um, we'll have a initial presentation by Stephen and Angela and then um, we'll have plenty of time for question and answer. It'll be a relatively short presentation and then um, the rest will, will they'll be able to take your questions. Um, if there's two ways to ask questions, you can raise your virtual hand, there's a hand icon in your user interface, and then um, I can unmute you and you can ask the question directly to Stephen and Angela. And that only works if you have a working microphone on your computer or if you've called in on the phone if you've entered your PIN number. Um, and you can also type the question into the question panel of the user interface and then I can relay it to, to Stephen and Angela. So you can ask questions either way. Um, if you're typing questions in on the question panel, feel free to send questions throughout the webinar. Um, clarifying questions, uh, we may ask them during the during their presentation, and more substantive questions will hold to the end. So anyway, great. Uh, Stephen and Angela, thank you so much for being here, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to hear about fish carbon, the role of marine vertebrates in the carbon cycle, and the potential application of these ecosystem services to the global climate challenge. Uh, my name is Angela Martin, and myself and my colleague Stephen Lutz will be presenting to you today. Um, Okay, so the plan is to give a bit of background on the importance of the ocean to life on Earth, the blue planet, a quick run through of the challenges and impacts of climate change on the ocean, an introduction to the concept of blue carbon, and then to talk about the fish connection and the eight fish carbon mechanisms. Finally, we will take a look at the future of fish carbon, including potential implications for policy and next steps. So firstly, the blue planet. Over 70% of the planet is covered by the ocean. The ocean is the, life, the Earth's life support system. It regulates temperature, climate and weather, provides seafoods and recreational opportunities. The living ocean governs planetary chemistry. It generates most of the ocean in the sea and atmosphere and drives the water, carbon and nitrogen cycles. Every second breath you take comes from the ocean. We need a healthy ocean for a healthy planet. The current status of the ocean is a cause for concern. We have lost 90% of the big fish in the sea. We have seen the decline of coral reefs and growth of dead zones. And while 12% of land is under some form of protection, less than 3% of the ocean is protected. One of the biggest impacts of, on the ocean is climate change caused by the, the, the release of greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide. Climate change impacts global weather and ocean processes. Its effects on the ocean include rising sea levels, changes in temperature, and reduced availability of oxygen. The increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide results in increased dissolved carbon dioxide in the ocean, which leads to reduced oceanic pH levels in a process known as ocean acidification. Ocean acidification has negative impacts on a variety of marine organisms particularly shellfish, reef-building corals, and various life stages of fish. Climate change presents a serious global challenge for current and future generations. It has been termed a defining issue of our era and poses a severe threat to human welfare, biodiversity, and ecosystem integrity, and possibly to life itself. In March of this year, the chairperson of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change stated that nobody on the planet will be untouched by climate change. To address climate change and successfully transition to a low carbon economy, the impacts of atmospheric carbon must be reduced without delay, with particular emphasis on the immediate reduction of emissions of greenhouse gases. Mitigation against impacts of climate change already being observed is also of vital importance, and the exploration of naturally existing mechanisms which mitigate climate change, such as carbon capture and storage, is currently underway. Natural systems from rainforests to seagrass meadows have been providing climate services, 
in a trident-tested way for millennia. Blue carbon is a concept that has been used since 2009 to describe carbon linked to the marine environment through coastal and open ocean ecosystems. The ocean is a major component of the global carbon cycle, responsible for roughly half of the annual accumulation and photosynthetic absorption of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide flux between the ocean and atmosphere is largely controlled by sea surface temperatures, circulating currents, and the biological processes of photosynthesis and respiration. Mangroves, marshes, seagrasses, algae, and especially microscopic phytoplankton take up atmospheric carbon dioxide into the ocean. Marine ecosystems therefore aid climate change mitigation by sequestering carbon from the atmosphere and providing natural carbon storage in biomass and sediments. Exploring how the value of coastal blue carbon can be used to support improved and sustainable ecosystem management is the focus of a number of groups and projects around the globe. Current blue carbon initiatives focus primarily on three coastal ecosystems, mangrove forests, saltwater marshes, and seagrass meadows. Fish connection. While blue carbon initiatives currently focus on coastal ecosystems, specifically plants and their associated sediments, much of the scientific focus of the oceanic carbon cycle has been on the roles of phytoplankton and zooplankton. The role of marine vertebrates in global climate change and carbon sequestration is largely invisible, as marine vertebrates are not included in most models of carbon cycling. However, an increasing number of studies are being published that explore the value of marine biota other than plankton in the biological carbon pump. Marine vertebrates play an important role in enhancing uptake of carbon by plants and facilitate carbon transport from surface waters to ocean sediments. Marine vertebrates may also have disproportionately large impacts on carbon uptake, storage and release through multiplier effects, whose magnitudes may rival those of more traditional carbon storage estimates. Although entitled Fish Carbon, the objective of our report is to highlight the role that all marine vertebrates play in oceanic carbon cycling, including fish, marine mammals, and sea turtles. The goal of the report is to introduce the concept and ask the following question. What role can marine vertebrate carbon services play in addressing the global climate challenge? Hopefully the report will assist policymakers to mainstream the natural value or benefits of marine vertebrates into marine management eventually climate change discussions, and to further scientific research on this subject. And much scientific research is needed regarding fish carbon. An issue of key importance is understanding the potential total contribution of fish carbon to oceanic carbon cycling in comparison to the role of the ocean's primary producers, particularly plankton. In science, we don't make decisions based on one study or results. We look for a pattern of results. Through the report, we present the emerging pattern of fish carbon and hopefully provide support for further exploration of the concept. This report highlights seven biological mechanisms provided by marine vertebrates that result in carbon sequestration, and one mechanism which may provide a buffer against ocean acidification. All of these mechanisms may have a role in the mitigation of climate change. This diagram shows the eight mechanisms of fish carbon. First is trophic cascade carbon, second is biomixing carbon, third bony fish carbonate, fourth whale pump, fifth twilight zone carbon, sixth biomass carbon, seventh deadfall carbon, and eighth marine vertebrate mediated carbon. So we start with trophic cascade carbon. In coastal blue carbon ecosystems, marine vertebrates regulate the uptake of atmospheric carbon through photosynthesis. The selective grazing of dugongs, manatees, and turtles regulates carbon uptake in seagrass meadows, while in giant kelp forests, sea otters regulate sea urchin populations, which would otherwise reduce the capacity for carbon uptake by kelp. In a recent publication by Hightower et al., the trophic cascade mechanism was demonstrated in this beautiful graphic. On the left-hand side, where there are few turtles, there are no seagrasses and therefore no capacity for carbon uptake and storage in seagrass sediments. Similarly, on the right-hand side, where there are no sharks, no sharks and many turtles, there are only few seagrasses due to overgrazing. In a healthy ecosystem, depicted second from the left, with uh, both top predators and turtles, there are pristine seagrass meadows 
Thus, marine vertebrates regulate this ecosystem's capacity to provide optimal carbon uptake and storage. Second fish carbon mechanism is biomixing. As marine vertebrates move through the water column, their movement creates turbulence and drag, which can bring nutrients from depth to surface waters. In the open ocean, where photosynthesis is otherwise nutrient limited, the action of biomixing can enhance the uptake of atmospheric carbon dioxide into the ocean. While the occurrence and significance of biomixing are currently debated, there is growing evidence that supports the validity of this mechanism, even by the smallest marine organisms. Okay, now I'm going to pass over to Stephen to continue the presentation. Hi there, this is Stephen Lutz with uh, Great Iron Dahl. Uh, I'm assuming everyone can hear me. Um, so basically, here's bony fish carbonate. In order to understand this mechanism, we have to first understand the co concept of ocean acidification, which is essentially that rising levels of atmospheric carbon leads to increased amounts of dissolved carbon in the ocean, which in turn lowers oceanic pH levels. Now this is important because lowered pH levels or ocean acidification can impact the formation of calcium carbonate structures. And these structures include the larval and adult stages of many marine vertebrates and invertebrates, including fish, shellfish, and coral reefs. So the bony fish carbon mechanism comes into play because bony marine fish, such as tuna, halibut, and herring, produce calcium carbonate as a waste product. And calcium carbonate is thought to increase the alkalinity of oceanic pH balance and could be considered as a buffer against ocean acidification. The implication of, bony, of this mechanism is that the sustainable management of fish populations could enhance this ecosystem service of buffering against ocean acidification. The next one is the well pump, which is a mechanism by which the nutrients, nutrients may be transported both vertically between depth and surface and horizontally across oceans, which promotes primary production. An example of this is the feeding behavior of sperm whales in the southern oceans. These whales feed at depth on animals such as squid, and when they come to the surface, they defecate. And their flocculent fecal material, I love that phrase, is rich in iron, which is essential for the growth of phytoplankton and consequent fixing of carbon in surface whales, in surface waters. Another example is the annual migration of baleen whales, which feed in the southern ocean and then travel to their birthing grounds in the lower tropical latitudes. And when they do that, they bring a lot of stored up nutrients with them which is similarly dispersed. To further advance this concept, a better understanding of the total contribution of the whale pump relative to the carbon cycling of plankton and zooplankton may be required. However, available research implies that the maintenance of healthy whale populations is important for nutrient transport and the fixing of carbon in the ocean. Twilight zone carbon is a mechanism where you have fish that live in deep waters undertaking vertical migration at, at night to feed on zooplankton in surface waters. And then during daylight hours, they go back down to depth and bring the organic matter with them, which they have ingested. These fish live in the ocean's twilight zone at depths of 200 to 800 meters and undertake this migratory feeding behavior to avoid predation. The mechanism comes into play because when these fish return to the deep waters, they're actually bringing organic carbon with them, which is ultimately released as feces, which may sink further into depths. So they, tr they are transporting carbon from the surface waters to the deeper, deeper waters. And that's important because the deeper carbon sinks, the longer it can potentially stay out of the atmosphere. And if carbon reaches the deep sea in sediment, it can be stored for thousands to millions of years. The next mechanism is biomass carbon. Carbon is stored in the biomass of every living creature on the planet. As marine vertebrates feed and grow, carbon naturally accumulates in their bodies and is stored over the lifetime of the animal. So all fish all, and all marine life store carbon in their bodies. And some marine mammals have extended lifespans, such as the bowhead whale, which has been reported to live up to 200 years. A better understanding of the total contribution of biomass carbon relative to that of plankton may be needed to further advance this concept. This includes understanding the fate and significance associated with bycatch 
and with fish consumed by humans. However, the implication of biomass carbon for oceanic carbon cycling is that healthy populations of fish and whale will secure the capacity for oceanic biomass storage and thereby the efficiency of this mechanism to play a role in oceanic carbon cycling. When the biomass carbon of marine organisms is not already removed by fishing or redirected through the oceanic carbon cycle by predation, their carcasses sink to the depth and carbon stored in their biomass enters deep sea ecosystems such as the animals and critters running around this, uh, this skeleton here. Organic carbon at the bottom of the ocean, as I mentioned, can be stored for thousands to millions of years. So the carcass of a large invertebrate transports organic carbon, naturally accumulated within its body when it falls to the sea floor. Deadfalls such as this have been primarily reported for whales, but have also been recently reported for other invertebrates, such as whale sharks and manta rays. Marine vertebrate mediated carbon is a kind of fancy way of having to avoid, to say, fish poop, which is essentially what this mechanism is all about. And you can see from the, from the fish, uh, the little particles sinking down, and that's fish poop. Okay. So marine vertebrates feed on all on lower trophic levels, such as plankton, zooplankton, and smaller fish. And through digestion, repackage that material, the organic carbon, into rapidly sinking fecal material. Researchers have found that the fecal matter of many moon vertebrates contains high amounts of carbon and sinks at rates exponentially greater than that of, a plankton, of carbon associated with plankton and zooplankton. Additionally, fish fecal material has been found to have low rates of dissolution, which means it can stay compacted together instead of being broken up and dissolved. In other words, it has a, ch a better chance to survive the, the distance it needs to, to go to get to the, to the ocean floor or need to sink. The rapid sinking and low dissolution rates associated with these particles indicate that marine vertebrate mediated carbon efficiently transports carbon to depth. So you might ask, why is this mechanism not being included in current models of oceanic carbon cycle? Well, the current key instrument used to understand oceanic carbon cycling is the sediment trap or sediment traps. And researchers have pointed out that sediment traps may be biased towards capturing the contributions of plankton and zooplankton and insufficient to register the contributions of marine vertebrates. Sediment traps capture the most homogeneous particles in the ocean, which are associated with plankton and zooplankton, but they're potentially missing these significant events associated with the marine vertebrates. Much scientific endeavor remains to be accomplished regarding this concept or this, this mechanism, including quantifying the role, its role in oceanic carbon cycling relative to that of plankton, zooplankton, and bacteria. However, the implication is that the maintenance of healthy populations of marine vertebrates, from anchovies to cod to whales to sea turtles and sharks, may facilitate the rapid transport of carbon from upper waters to the deep ocean and seafloor, where it can be sequestered on millennial timescales. The policy implications of fish carbon are quite broad, as fish carbon relates to potentially all marine vertebrates in the ocean. We will only go over a couple examples here. Okay. One, obviously, is in the addressing of climate change. Fish carbon offers new directions and opportunities for international agreements and coalitions which govern the management of ocean areas. It also brings climate change into new areas of discussion and agreement, i.e. bringing climate change into new management. Secondly, marine management and fisheries policy. The sustainable management and the restoration of fish stocks is a general objective the fisheries management across the globe. Fish carbon complements this objective and that would add new dimensions to fisheries policy. For example, the objective of fish carbon, the objectives of fish carbon are the same as those in addressing the global threat of illegal fishing or pirate fishing as it has it been called. Fish carbon also gives us another reason to address the threats to ocean health, such as marine debris and pollution. And thirdly, marine protected areas. So the World Park Congress was just held in Australia, and there's been a lot of discussion on this. Marine protected areas typically suffer from a lack of funding, enforcement, and engagement. Realizing the value of fish carbon could support the management of marine protected areas, as these could be also seen as carbon sequestration areas, not just marine protected areas. So moving forward. 
An improved understanding of the eight mechanisms that we present here is required to appreciate the true potential of fish government's role in addressing the global climate challenge. Nonetheless, the, fish, the question of fish carbon poses an innovative opportunity for the world to potentially protect ocean ecosystems from the coastal waters to the high seas with the objective of, har of harvesting long-term benefits from the ocean's diverse resources and services while simultaneously mitigating for climate change. It has been said that more is known about the surface of the moon than our oceans. Fish carbon gives us an additional reason to explore our blue biosphere. Moving forward, the recognition of marine vertebrate carbon services can encompass a wide range of actions. We've suggested a few key research op objectives and opportunities. The first being education and outreach, the engagement and education of marine stakeholders, policymakers, and the general public to, to raise the profile of this concept. The second lead, policy and management. There's no reason why we can't start to recognize or think about the value of fish carbon in relation to national and international legislation frameworks related to the management of natural marine resources. Thirdly, coordinated research. This includes marine science to identify the gaps in understanding that we need to, that need to be filled to better under the evidence this mechanism. See which, one, see which, which mechanisms work be, better than others to build scientific consensus to support this concept and to generate necessary global modeling which, are, which can be used to inform policymakers with relation to climate change policies. Socioeconomic research could also be undertake, undertaken to understand the potential benefits and impacts resulting from the application of fish carbon policies to coastal and marine stakeholders. And I'd like to end on a thought um, just to say that, that fish carbon is not a silver bullet to address climate change. Okay? And other actions must be taken simultaneously, simultaneously to do such, particularly the reduction of greenhouse gases. Okay, so fish carbon is not a substitute for the reduction of greenhouse gases. However, the broad relevance of fish carbon presents an excellent potential to collaborative, a, a collaborative opportunity in which to further explore the concepts outlined, build consensus, and form co coalitions for meaningful, effective, and immediate climate change action. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Angela and Steven. Uh, it's incredibly interesting. Um, so we don't have to currently have any questions, but I did have a question. Um, it seems like this report is looking mostly at um, wild uh, fish. Um, what are your thoughts about the blue carbon implications for uh, aquaculture? Well, we didn't really get into that, uh, into aquaculture too much. And I, I do know that there's some studies looking at, um, I guess, uh, uh, particles beneath uh, tuna um, holdings, or I guess tuna, tuna pens. But mm -hmm. I, we just didn't really get into that too much. Um, I think that's probably a next step for this. OK. Um, and w before we go on, I did want to tell, remind people uh, how to ask questions. Uh, you can type them into the question interface, or you can raise your virtual hand to be unmuted. Um, and actually, we do have one hand raised. Let's see if we can. Uh, I'll work on, uh, on that. Let's see. Roberto, did you want to ask your question? Okay, I'm not sure if uh, Roberto's mic is working, but he did uh, send in a question to the question uh, panel. Let's see. Is there any quantitative data that would suggest groups or taxa that would have the highest value in terms of blue carbon? Um, yeah, I, 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 I think not yet. I mean, I, I think um, this, is, this report just introduces the concept, and I think that's definitely one of the next steps. Uh, a lot of the concepts that we presented focus on whales, uh, so I, I guess that's one place to start. And also, a, a few of the concepts recognize that larger marine vertebrates play a larger role in the mechanisms that they that they are related to. So it may be um, a first starting point if we go to going for the larger uh, larger marine vertebrates. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, there was a, another question. Are there any terrestrial models for this approach? I'm not um, entirely sure. OK, so I guess it would be related to uh, uh, maybe, maybe it's trophic cascade carbon, where you have predators um, in, and grazers 
and the interactions between the two that, that you do have terrestrial models on, um, you know, for, for I guess, wolves and, and sheep, and that sort of stuff, and how they influence uh, grazing. Okay, thank you. And let's see, are there some more questions that have come in? Uh, how deep does fish carbon have to be in the ocean to be sequestered? Uh, what are the time frames? Is there simply, um, is this simply getting fish carbon into the ocean conveyor belt? Okay, so um, the, the idea generally there is that is that you'd like to get the, or you'd like to have the carbon sink uh, as deep as possible. Um, if it, if, it, if it reaches down to the sort of uh, to the bottom of the ocean, then it's it, it's sequestered in terms of thousands of years. If it reach, if it makes it into the sediments, it's sequestered in millions of years. Um, but how those particles and how and, and where those particles go and if they actually make it to the bottom of the ocean, I think is is definitely something that we need to look at if we want to advance a fish carbon approach. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question: uh, Is there any published literature uh, in this area? Yes, there is, and if. If you look at the references that we have, we have quite quite a few references in our report. Um, so every mechanism is, is referenced to as, as much as we could as much as we could give, and I think that would be a great starting point because essentially the report is a review of these mechanisms, um, and I think I think we do a pretty good job on that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I, I would. Curious, are there any sort of back of the envelope calculations about how these mechanisms stack up um, to each other or, or and other blue carbon mechanisms? Yeah, so not yet, um, but I think the World Ocean Council put out a report recently looking at the carbon sequestration, total carbon sequestration value of life in the high seas, and they termed it at about $140 billion, and that's including plankton, that's sort of all life in the high seas. Um, and that is referenced in our report as well. Okay, so great. If you look, just Google, I think, $140 billion and you'll see what the, the report that we're looking at. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, if there's any other questions, go ahead and send them in right now. Let's see. We do have another one. Okay, uh, taking into consideration the, the progress with blue carbon for plants, what recommendation would you have to turn this concept into policy? Um, I think we're probably uh, you know, quite a ways from, from policy. Uh, I, I think um, with blue carbon for plants, I mean, it was, it, it's, it's, still, it's still not fully there yet. So I would, I would definitely, it, it depends what policy you're going after. If you're going after climate change policy, I'd say you've got a long ways to go. But if you're going after um, using these values and having these values be incorporated into uh, sort of more national goals, well, there, there could be potential avenues there. Um, but I, I think for climate change policy, we're still, we're still pretty far away. Okay. Um, great, Stephen. Uh, and, and Stephen and Angela, thank you so much for presenting on this. Um, Stephen, can I ask you to give a plug for tomorrow's Blue Carbon webinar, too? Yes, before okay. We go. So, so in an hour from, or at least half an hour from this time, tomorrow, we're going to have a presentation, and that's going to be myself and Christian Newman from Grid Arundel, and we will be pre presenting on a report that we did for the, for the, um, through the Abu Dhabi Blue Carbon Demonstration Project, and it's called Building Blue Carbon Projects, an Introductory Guide. And I'll also be giving an overview of the Global Environment Facilities uh, Blue Forest Project, which I'm the coordinator of. Okay. Okay, fantastic. So if anybody else has any questions, um, can you, actually, your, your screen has gone to Skype, Stephen. Um, oh, yes. Sorry. Can you pop uh, up anything with your contact information? Right. Yes, so f there. fantastic. So if anybody has any questions, I encourage you to get in touch with Angela and Stephen uh, for further information and to any discussions. And I'd like to thank everyone who was able to make it here today. Um, please go ahead and share the report with colleagues. Um, and yeah, so we're, we're very, very glad we were able to host this. Can I just and, say one thing? So, yes, so the, report, the report was introduced as an advanced copy to facilitate discussions on November the 9th in Abu Dhabi. 
and it, it should be finalized um, by the end of the week. Okay, and another, okay, and that's good week. to know. Okay, thank you. Okay, and there's some thanks coming in from uh, on, the, on the question panel to, to you guys. So we're very glad you were able to come to, uh, today to present. And so, um, thank you. okay, then thank you, everyone, and have have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thanks.